You're welcome back. At this moment, our hearts go to the people of Abuja as uh, a multi-story building collapsed um, and some people are feared dead. We know that uh, already 10 people have been rescued, but um, we do not know their condition right now, if uh, uh, all will be well with them. And there are so many other people who are feared trapped in that building. A lot of people sleep at the, uh, the um, ground floor of uh, that uh, multi-story building and some people are at the top there so we don't know how the casualties the number of casualties that will be there and the number of fatalities that might come out of that whatever be the case our hearts go to them we do hope that more rescues uh, will be done today but we forgot um, earlier on we should have told you this um, there's a diversion according to the Lagos state government the permanent secretary of the ministry of transportation engineer abdul hafiz toriola um, made an announcement on Wednesday, August 23, uh, that the Lagos State Government uh, is diverting uh, traffic at a Lagba ramp in what's Lagos on Lagos Abiokuta Expressway from Thursday, August 24, for the duration of 18 weeks. So if that is your route that you ply, uh, be uh, advised. You might want to take uh, alternative routes uh, for 18 days now from today. And he said the decision was taken for continuation of the Yanokwaja bus terminal project. So be advised. This is a traffic advice for you. Uh, make sure you look for alternative routes. Or if you can help it, um, you don't have to use that route uh, for anything. So if your, your business will take you out of that route and through that route, and you can stay for the 18 days without going back that way, well, but no that that is what is going to be happening on that road. But this time now to look at what made the headlines uh, on some of our national dailies. And we're glad to have with us to analyze some of these uh, headlines, uh, architect Ezekiel Nyaitok, a public affairs analyst that will be talking fr uh, from Akwaibom with us. Good morning and welcome to the program, uh, sir. Thank you. Good morning. Just at this time from Abuja. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> you're, you're a Nigerian. You can be anywhere. I so, hope... so if the network is unstable, no, it's because I'm not in Aquaiba where the network is very stable. Oh, you had to say that. I know. <laughs> I hope you don't have a property that might be demolished anytime soon. No, Wike is my guy. <laughs> mm. So, so you are you are sure that your property, even if you have, will not be demolished? Mm. No, no. I, I, as an architect, I do due diligence. I look at the master plan, and then whatever I have is definitely within areas that I don't lose any sleep on. Okay, very good. Uh, now let's um, go to the uh, headlines. We will begin today with uh, headlines from the uh, the Guardian. The Guardian newspaper is what we're beginning with today. And the first headline there uh, is from the, the boldest headline, I like to say that, because it, it might not be the most important, is that 24 years after Nigeria's space program loses traction despite yearly allocation. And I just, this headline is coming at a time where India is landing on the moon. And our own 25 years after the space program loses traction is what we are talking about. And we do not know, will we ever make headway in that? Let's get your comments uh, on that headline, first of all, before we go to others. Yeah, my, my very first comment is that you lose what you have. Did they have traction before now to, for you to start talking of them losing? Secondly, it, um, I bring this up again, and um, I, I can't forget it in a hurry. Uh, when Mr. Donald Duke was a governor, I've, I think I've said it before in this program, and um, we've been very good friends right from time, and he told me, yeah, I'll do anything for you on housing, land policy, but the money I have, I will not be able to in, go into housing. I want to concentrate on you know, tourism. Mm. And that guy became probably till now the only governor that has branded a state. That's the power of vision. Nigeria wants to do everything. Why don't we just look at, get focused on the things we must do for today and the things we must lay a foundation for tomorrow and get real with ourselves. 
this issue of space, as much as uh, I think uh, the K is missing in my name, the last part is E-T-O-K, you know, this issue of, um, you know, the, the, the space and all this and all that, the question is, have we sat down to count the cost, to look at where we are and to situate it with time with respect to what we can afford? But every year we spend so much money on things that we, we are not even, you know, every, like the refineries. If you look at how much we spend on the staffing and maintenance of all these things of the refineries, it, it's obscene. It's, it's a sin, you know? And then you now come to these agencies. My brother, I was trying to, if you look at the Orasian report, and there are some agencies that you are going to see that you're like, excuse me, wait, where is this? How is that? But they have boards, they have staff, they have offices. Some of the offices are rented. So I look, I look forward to a, a president that will come and play down on the politics and play up the governance and bite the hard bullet to reset, a forced reset for us to be able to start to think like a people that have brain where it's supposed to be. So that headline for me, you say you lose traction when, when you never had traction. I want to know <laughs> at what point we made such progress that people say, wow, Nigeria is coming into the space um, you know, arena. I, I don't think, I think yeah. it's one of those places that we Yeah, but you, you said, you said we're, we should be prioritizing and seeing what we can afford. But is it really a matter of not being able to afford these things that it is happening the way it is happening? For instance, if money is budgeted for refinery, it is supposed that that money should be used for that purpose because they do, did due diligence, feasibility studies, whatever name you want to call it, and found out that this money at least will take it to a, a particular percentage. But it doesn't seem as if that money is used at all. So on the one hand, we can afford it, on the other hand, we spend the money, but we don't see the results. So, do you I'll, think it's I'll the tell same you thing? This for free. You know, on two occasions, in fact, this is the third, though this is the, the first time I really, really campaigned, but at least on two occasions, I dedicated interest to be a governor. Now, if you sit down, if you are serious and you're not sent by money, you are sent by passion, if you sit down, the first time I had migraine in my life, Three days was when I decided to do a five-year audit of the budget of Acquired Bombo State. It was painful. I couldn't sleep. God has blessed me such that I can stay for six months without having a headache. I, I'm not, I, I have divine health. I will say that for, I mean, very easily. I'm giving God the glory. But for three days, I had, I had what I've never had in my life. Why was that so? This thing we call budget is a ritual that has no meaning and relevance to reality. It is such a deceitful document that, especially at the state level, they will budget 20 billion in this particular you know, um, ministry that they know they are not going to do anything. At the end of the day, they probably would have spent 500 million. Then another ministry where they don't want to know the acron is they will put maybe 5 billion. But go and look at what is spent at the end of the day, over 50 billion. You know, they, they, they're so fraudulent. In um, Why am I saying all this? It is that our budgeting process is not what we should come and be saying, oh, it is budgeted for, it's not budgeted for. The second thing is, I, I'm an architect, I'm a construction person. You realize that projects last for 20 years. Why is that so? I'll give you a little example. I want to do road. You put in the budget, maybe this road is supposed to be 10 billion, okay? You put in this year's budget, 2 billion. What will 2 billion do? It will allow me to, you know, mobilize the sites, clear the earthworks, and maybe start digging the gutters and things like that. You understand me? Now, guess what happens? In the next budget cycle, you do not give me the next money that will allow me to, you know, do the asphalting of the earthwork that I have done. So we leave it, the rains come, and then wash away everything I had done. So when I come back, I'm now asking for variation to do the earthworks again, right? And this ritual continues. Why don't we budget such that we know the timings and the payments to be done, the milestones, 
and then we follow those milestones, but that's not done. Maybe in this milestone, I'm supposed to be paid five billion because I'm doing the asphalting and all those things, and they go and put two billion. That two billion will not allow me to start. Maybe I can just maybe it was about five kilometers. Maybe I'll do one kilometer. Then the other four kilometers they will get bad. I come back by the time you give the next three billion. I'm going back to do the earthworks and not asphalting the next because what I've done before is false. So what am I saying? Our budgeting process is very defective, and you know a lot of times these things are not for the essence but for servicing the boys and creating employment is like government is is put together to create employment and that's not the work of government government is not to create employment government is to provide an enabling environment for the organized private sector in a capitalist economy that we run to thrive so that you do the things that are, you you ask yourself am i an effective administrator because the, the, the act of governance on its own, the essence, is the management of the resources of the people to the larger interests and benefits of the generality of the people. And is that what we are doing? No, it's not. It's servicing our ego and then servicing the boys so that we can get the next election, and that ritual continues. I look forward to a governor that would like to bite the bullet and say, if I perish, I perish. I don't care about second terms. I'll do it right. And if Mr. President cannot say so, then we're just in for another four-year ride. Mm. Okay, let's take another headline. Naira resumes free fall, depreciates to 890 Naira per dollar at the parallel market. I did also hear that um, the Naira on the I&E window is about 760 or so. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Two things. Please, let's think through policies. Let's not play to the gallery. Let's not do much of reaction. I can forgive the past in that everything, there was no driver. Today, we do not only have the Minister of Finance, we also have him double as the coordinating minister of the economy. Mm. What that means is that they are no longer silos. Do you understand me? There is somebody who can see the interrelationship, the interlinkages, the interrelation you know, of the different facets and industries uh, uh, and ministries as relevant. Let them look at the monetary policies that we have and relate it to the fiscal policies. In the fiscal policy right now, we really don't have a central bank governor. If need be, let us make the man that is there to be substantial, okay? If need be, I don't know, whatever is the process is, so that the man can now know he's sitting down well. If not so, if he knows that he can leave the place anytime, he does what he can while he can. But when he knows that he has a tenor of four years, he knows he'll be held accountable for every decision he takes. And between him, the Minister of Finance and Coordinating Minister of the Economy, and the National Economic Council, they should actually sit down and ask themselves, what policy do we want to put in place? Even if it is not, you know, um, you know we, we, we can understand something that doesn't work for now. But we know a man that chooses to plant coconut instead of groundnut understands that while he is still tending the coconut, the man that planted groundnut is eating. He will look at the man, but when he knows that once this coconut grows, he will not have to be planting it every year. You know, the, you know there's, I think it was Winston Churchill that said, uh, Winston Churchill, I think, that says that hope is the anchor that stabilizes the soul. The moment you have hope, you can wait. You understand me? Yeah. But we are here today. We don't know what the end game is. We don't understand what is happening. It is what you can while you can. Que sera, sera. And that's not the way government should be run. I'm a private sector person. I've never, ever in my life accepted any paying appointment. Never. I'm strictly a private sector person. And I'm sitting down here. I'm trying to do a forecast. Let me give you a very little illustration. I built a, I, I, I'm into real estate, I do estate, okay? Then a man trusts me and pays me 100% for, say, a story building, you know? Maybe a four bedroom, uh, what we call duplex, okay? Yeah. And then he pays me maybe about 70 million, right? 
Now, this is just at maybe foundation, what we call German floor, you know, level. He pays me upfront because he doesn't want to have any problem. Now, within six months, the materials escalate by over 35%. Now, my own margin was about maybe 25%. But the materials have gone over 35%. Then the question is, what moral rights do I have to come and tell this man who had paid me 100% for him to, you know, pay me additional money? While, on the other hand, I know I will not be able to deliver except I dig in and then, you know, may be able to use my resources to make it up. On account of that, what do I do? I, be, I, I, I take a policy of guys in the contract, it's going to be milestones based on this and that. And that's not the way to run business. And that man who knows that if he doesn't move that money away, that money will go, will now end up coming to a point where I ask for more payment, he cannot pay because the money has gone. There, there's a way that people operate. So it's difficult for you to run business as a private sector person if you cannot do the proper forecasting. Forecasting is the soul of a private enterprise. And right now, you know, look at some weeks back, it had come down to about um, 780, and then within days, it's gone back to 900. It, it's a yo-yo. Things can't work that way. You can't plan. You can't forecast. So I'm really concerned about our future. Yeah. The, on the punch, the headline that carries that story says that uh, Naira tumbles to 900 Naira per dollar. Uh, but the CBN vows that BDC operators will be clamped down. <laughs> Do you think that is a solution to the free fall you of know, the Naira? You know, you know, sorry, sorry, with all due respect, those are the sort of things that just upset me. Are those guys the problem? You've created a differential of over 200 Naira. It's commonsensical for you to know that there's going to be round tripping. It's just commonsensical. Especially when your operation is so opaque. There's a way it could be. And, you know, once you go there to get from the, you know, from the official market, you, they, they are, there are certain paradigms that are set. There are certain procedures that are not bendable. There is integrity check on them. It is for certain purposes. And there's no cronies involved. There's no political patronage involved. If that is the case, even if there's a differential of 500 Naira, that's just um, like to, to use a sledgehammer to kill a fly. And somebody knows that the risk he takes, that if he tries to divert, the punishment is so steep that it's not worth the wahala. Do you understand me? So, but why, don't, why do you want to? Some people are just adventurists. You know, they want to try it out. But why don't you have us a policy where we know that this is the way. Now, do you have the, the resources for you to show up the difference? Number two, can you stop the rush for money? I keep asking this question. The petroleum marketers are rushing and mopping up money to go and buy, you know, a petrol and come. Why can't we do this swap arrangement? Direct sales, direct purchase. Such that they are given allocation of crude in exchange for you know a certain quantity of um, petrol that will come in and other derivatives. Why can't we do it? In that case, the crude is, is ours. You know, I say this: imagine a man that harvests yams. No matter how much the yam costs in the market, the one that he brings out to eat in the house. He does not tell you the market value of the food he's eating. Mm. We bring the crude from our ground here. We don't buy it. So why do we need to sell it and get money so that we can now take the money to go and buy it again, you know, the refined product? Mm. If, if you cannot refine the product, I've said this before and I say it again. What is wrong? And I want to repeat it. I want Nigerians to tell me. Let the, 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 the minister or the minister president look at this so-called illegal, illegal refineries. A good, let me tell you something. I, I went to a guy that was um, to weld something for me somewhere. And I told him about um, the diesel. I said, I'll supply you diesel because it was substantial. He said, oh, God, no. 
or gather do not this you know the you know they work for us. I said, which one did they use? He said, the one where we they do they, they do locally. He said that one if they born better, that one the last better. Do you understand me? I, I was taken aback. I said, what about the risk factor? Are you sure it's properly done? He said, oh, guys, you see, he said, oh, guys, let me tell you the truth. Over 80% of us, when they use this, now nah, this one we they use. No be that to our own. Import, import. This one, this will understand, they do it well. So it is good. Now, at the risk of sounding like I'm endorsing it, what stops the government rather than destroying those illegal refineries? Undergoing a process. Yes, it might be crude. Let me end this note on this because it's very important. There were two cities some years back that we used to laugh at as having inferior uh, uh, products. Mm. What were those two cities? Taiwan. Taiwan. And Aba. And Aba. Mm -hmm. Taiwan and Aba. Aba made. Aba made. We used to laugh at and Taiwan. Taiwan continued on that crude method until they refined it. And today, Taiwan is in a different uh, world altogether. But in Aba, we were too fast to jettison it as being inferior. And we re ref refused to, you know, kind of patronize those guys, let them start to buy machines and buy certain equipment that will make their production better and over a period will become good enough like others, if not better. Why can't the federal government as a policy say that we're not going to buy any more uh, refined products in the next three years? Mr. President, we said, during my tenure, I'll get it. Number one, we're going to fix refineries, even if it is one of them. If I need to become, now that I'm the minister, if I need to pay that refinery every week, I go there for one hour. You can't do it. There's a Greek adage that says, Amampo, Amambre, Argof, no, no. Amambre, Argof, no, no. If you like something, you've got to pay the price for that thing. Do you understand me? So president can afford to say, I can give one hour in a week and go to Port Harcourt Refinery and walk from there. And I need to know what the problems are. And then within six months, you'll be shocked. You don't need to go again because things are starting to work. Number two, Minister of State Petroleum Resource for Oil. I want you to go to the Niger Delta, to the creeks. Give me a report. Tell them not to run again. Find out what we can do. What are the health hazards that are involved? How can we take care of it? What are the environmental impacts that we cannot do? What are the equipment that is that they are having to do manually that we can do something? Bring the Chinese in. Let them give us technology to take care of that. At the end of two years, you'll be shocked that we are refining good products, both from the refineries and from this, um, you know, <clears throat> so-called illegal refineries who are actually feeding us in the Niger Delta. And I'll tell you that for free. I want somebody to come on air and say that what Ngaito is saying is absolute balderdash. That is not true. And if it is true, then why are we pretending doing the ostrich and pretending we don't know where the answer is? Must we continue to feed the, 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 the whims and caprices of these people that are sucking us dry? These are people that are not nationalists. All they care about is their personal profit. Let Mr. President look at what I've said and say that what I'm saying is not correct. So, my brother, and then mm. the gas. I'm happy that we have a young man today. I mean, you know, when they were there, I'll just quickly throw this in and there. When they were doing the ministerial briefings and then uh, not, not briefings, you know, allocation of portfolio, and um, my, a, a guy that I know very well was given gas, I was quite worried and everything. Until I sat down with him some days back, and, and this guy was, was, he amazed me. I didn't know how Mr. President got to have such information about him and put him there. He's not a gas sector person, but he has the drive, the energy, and the, the focus. So such people, enhance them, give them wings to fly. Those who are eager, they are hungry to make a mark. Not all these old people who have made so much money, they're just looking for a way to make sure that they escape from EFCC. These are other people who are like eager to make a mark on time. When I was a I like that push. So... Mm. 
Uh, if Mr. President can do that, I think we'll be the better for it. Yeah, well, um, experience has taught us Any that. Hearing? Experience has taught us that um, uh, some, some young may not always be best. Young may not always be best. We've seen cases of the youngest no, government about young. it's about that we've energy. had. Mm. No, no, no. I'm not. No, I'm, I'm an advocate for the young, but I know that within I have found the young people who are not just informed, energetic, driven. They are eager to make a mark on the sands of time. Mm. Nyetok has already had his life. Housing Man of the Year, you know, uh, you know, Lifetime Achievement Award in housing and blah, blah, blah. That's that. If I made something Minister of Housing, I'll need to look for something to, to, to add to the punch. But imagine a younger person coming in. He wants to also make a mark. Do you get the point? So I could be driv driven by nationalistic instincts. But what is driving the old people that are there outside of being able to escape from EFCC and the rest? finding the National Assembly as where they go to hide, or government portfolio where to hide. But the young people are not hiding. They are looking for a way to make a mark. So I'm advocating from them, not because they are young, so to speak, not age, I'm not of age, but because they are hungry, because they are energetic, because they see their future at stake. They have something at stake. November 1, I'll be 60, okay? And then they are in their 30s. It will take another 30 years, 20 years to come to where I'm already today. So they have more stake in the system and society than I do. Mm, okay. Um, another headline here is on the punch. State debt may hit 1.34 trillion naira over palliative loans. And then the writers there are saying governors to begin palliative loans repayment December. Federal government gives three months grace. And then Gombe, Katsina get 2 billion naira each. Lament inadequate relief items. Obaseki Knox federal government. Okay, palliatives were given to uh, states. First of all, we didn't hear about it until we were told that 48% of that money will be returned. Uh, it was a loan to the states and will be returned. And the governor started kicking against it. That's when we heard that palliative money, the $5 billion that they said to every state, has been given already. Now... They are going to have three months grace, and by December, they will start paying back this money, which means this is just the palliatives forever. Nothing is coming in again. In fact, in December, the states are supposed to be paying back, not to get another palliative for the people, but they will be paying back. And the debt of the states may hit 1.34 trillion naira because of palliatives. <laughs> so, uh, well, I'll tell you your this comments. Mm. Yes. Number one is, I don't know why Gombe State and the other people will get two billion, because I thought it was um, Five kind billion, of a yeah. star on bread, but maybe additional, I don't know, but uh, that's not my issue. I, I want to say that um, a lot of times we use the name of the poor to enrich the rich. I am one that is absolutely uncomfortable with this craze about palliative, palliative. Because in six months, you have put five times 37, five times 30 is already 150, I think you have get close to 200 billion into creating dependency syndrome. You talk about 120,000 bags of rice. You d d d divide it up and you discover that five villages are sharing one bag of rice. And I imagine how me, I'm giving one bag of rice to my village. Who and who is going to get? You are taking five villages to share one bag of rice. So much so that a whole family, I, I don't know if you can, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I had made an open letter to Mr. President. In that open letter to Mr. President, I said, why don't you embark on what I call enterprise estates? I did an analysis where I said, the, the money for Aquaibo, don't let it enter that voicemail in six years, in six months. Rather, that money will establish an enterprise estate in 
each of the 10 federal constituencies. This enterprise estate will comprise of 200 studio apartments, each of them with a portable farm, a fish pond, and a microprocessing unit. And then you have 200 people building these 200 units. Imagine the money that gets into the system. And you now have 200 um, young people being beneficiaries is like a school where they get trained and they get churned out. That thing in the next 15 years is still there, churning out people that have an interface with them, um, you know, um, uh, the, the Agri Development Bank, with their, or with Bank of Industries, and you have people who are trained, you know, uh, specialists in this, and it goes on like that. That is the money that would have entered voicemail in six months. In Akwaibom, it will be a legacy in 10 federal constituencies that will be there for the next 15 years. So why don't we get a little more creative with this? You know, this let's start to have a mentality of production as against consumption. The consumption politics, hey, I know more, they to give them now, now, so that they go now, 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 now. What happens to them six months after? That man that you have given, that uh, maybe, how much were they saying, 10,000 or 5,000, you know, every month for six months. At the end of six months, this money stops to come. What have you done to that person? You've created a social stigma because I say, oh, my guy, that your money alpha, you know, they get them again. A man that works on food, don't give him KK if that KK is not going to be for him to keep. If not so, you give him KK for six months. And everybody knows him as a KK rider, a KK, KK person. After six months, you remove the KK. Those who were envious could now start saying, my bros, how far? Where are your KK now? Make it come there. They know it has been taken. It's no longer available. So what you do, you, you create a social stigma on that person. You create a dependency syndrome on that person. And at the end of the day, you are going to create a social problem that can lead that person into things like drugs or crime or things like that to be able to sustain. But if he was walking and taking keke the way he was, he was looking for a day that God will bless him with his own. So I think that we need to have a government that thinks more of the people and not on what they can deceive the people and look good in the interim and, that, and it ends there. I was just trying to make a calculation of uh, this 5 billion naira. If you're buying a bag of rice, for instance, for 40,000 naira, that will give you about 125 bags of rice and then uh, if you have if you're buying it for 30,000 naira which is not possible right now in our economy then you'll be getting about 166 bags of rice in a place like no, no, I, I think it would be uh, it won't be 166,000 maybe 166,000 yes, that's yes, what it's 125,000 or 166,000 yes. bags yes. And okay, look at you put that in Aquaibom state how many families you. will get it now 150,000, okay, for 31 local governments, let's take 150 and 30, okay, you realize that in a local government, you are giving them um, 30, 150, you are giving them about 50,000 bags, mm. okay? Now, when you, when you divide that, I, I, no, my mathematics is wrong. When you divide that, you come to what I said before. We a vill about three, four, five villages are sharing one bag of rice. Mm. That's for six months. Old. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. Yeah. That's for six months. It, it, it doesn't add up. It doesn't make sense. But if you aggregated that into a productive venture, I keep saying this. I wish I would have an opportunity to make a presentation on this enterprise estate to Mr. President. I did it at the uh, you know, when, when, let me just, in about, in 2015, everybody has this thing that, oh, Akiten Yaito was the only African as a main speaker at the Global Conference on Affordable Housing in Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur. What people don't know is that it was a specific product that I presented that they say, wow, this makes sense. It needs to hit a global stage. Please, can you come and give it to us at a global level? Do you understand me? That's what it was. And it was then captured in our national housing policy. It's there in our housing policy. Because, you know, they, they, they took it off. But since then, 
It's been like people just keep it hush hush. And I, I believe that God will open a door for me to make that presentation to Mr. President. This is something that gets the money down to the grassroots. Because talking about, you know, I'm a social governance advocate. And social governance is a bottom to top approach to governance and development with the primary objective of bringing the citizens out of poverty. So developing the rural areas is my own area of special interest. So I'm thinking in terms of what can we do within the social areas that uh, rural areas that is sustainable and yet brings money to them at that level. So it's about about clear thinking and I hope that we start to come up and you know enterprise estate is not the only thing. There are other products that people have. Let them start to aggregate those special products that are rural area targeted that will be able to make impact, instant impact on a productive you know, um, uh, capacity or, or basis. And then we'll start to have where we are having things that we can export. Number one, we play down on the things that we import. We're importing rice. We can become self-sufficient in rice. We don't need to import. We, we are importing tomatoes, tomato paste. This stuff, imagine in each of the enterprise areas, I'm having 500, you know, tomato farms and fish ponds. You know, if you extrapolate that, you can become, self, Aquivon can feed the whole of Nigeria on catfish. Mm. Do you understand me? So you create an alternate economy. But people don't think that way. They want to collect palliative, buy, supply, and do contract and make money from the contract. When they tell you the cost of bag of rice that they are supplying, buy. You know, they don't tell us those things, so. Mm -hmm. They tell you, oh, they brought 150,000 bags of rice. Please go and ask them where they bought it from and how much they were paying for each of them. Uh, well, so we're, this... even though we are not comfortable with uh, these palliatives, I'm not as well because it, it's just a scam. The way uh, we've, it's, it's and, and especially knowing that palliatives, this word palliative uh, came to us uh, at the time when we had COVID. And we saw what happened to the palliatives. Some of the people were hoarding the palliatives to distribute as their birthday gifts to people. Some to use it as their uh, campaign strategies, campaign uh, giveaways and all that. And now, so question, even now, even now, when we are not comfortable, we are worried about the distribution of these palliatives that they're talking about. And GSS is warning in the leadership newspaper, GSS warns governors against shoddy distribution of palliatives. Will this even work? Can they monitor Listen them? to me. You see, I have a problem sometimes with GSS. Let me tell you something. You see, El Rufai, eh? I get problem with El Rufai, but there are certain things, fundamentals, that El Rufai has done in the past that I'm very happy with. When he was in the FCT, before ever doing anything, he looked for the big heads. He didn't talk. He looked for the big heads. Unlike my organ wicked that is talking. He looked for the, He hit them, bam, bam, bam. But we started here. Have you heard? Everybody has demolished the House of National Chairman or PDP. And he was in PDP. You hear? He has demolished, you know, demolished the House of this general law. By the time he took on three people, before he, 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 the engines rave to go to Massacre or One Man Village, or the people have run. They said, This man, man, don't come home. But EFC is coming. You know, there's a difference between this, this is like a joke, you know the Yoruba guy, and then the worry guy. The Yoruba guy will remove his shirt. He will just declare, oh boy, I go finish you. When I finish, go be like, say, trailer hit you. He go do this, ba ba ba. In fact, this is, do you understand me? Come and see show. But worry guy, he will look at you. He will give you, pa. He said, guy, I go sound you. He don't slap you finish. Do you get the point? So let EFCC, just keep quiet. DSS. Target one, two, three of these people. Hit them. And the people will say, oh boy, see what the EFCC they do. And when they ask the EFCC, what did they have? They say, we never start. But, it, but the DSS to... is warning the governors that they should not uh, uh, be shoddy in their distribution of these palliatives. Can they do anything to the governors while they are still on seat even? No. They let me tell you. What are they Don't even not, going to do? Wait now, governor gets immunity, but governor gets the boy. 
Mm, Governors okay. don't distribute these things. I see. You know? Mumjinekbe, Ngoreka. Another Greek. I can't speak in a lion so that the mother go come. Mm. You understand me? So the governors have immunity, no problem. I told you when I went to World Bank with Madame Okonjo Iwala and won the talk of uh, the national, the, this thing, our housing, uh, this thing, land, land use uh, act. act yeah. Then in US, in World Bank, they said, architect, forget that thing, you know, go change. Let's walk around it. I can't forget that expression till tomorrow. Let's walk around it. You understand me? So we may not be able to hold the governors. But we can hold their commissioners. We can hold their heads of parastatals. We can hold people. When governors say, make do, they say, Your Excellency, you know, these police people, these uh, ESCC people, the way they are doing, do you get the point? For their self preservation, they will look for a better way to make sure that they themselves are not put in harm's way. Okay. Uh, well, this is where we have to draw the curtain. There are so many other headlines that we would have loved to treat, but um, this is how far we can run on uh, these. Thank you so much, architect um, Nyaito, for coming on the show. Thank you. God bless you. Okay. That was architect Nyaito, uh, Ezekiel Nyaito, uh, talking to us from Abuja today, and we do hope that you had a wonderful time being with us. We'll take a short break. When we return, we'll be looking at the fact that federal government has ignored a 17-year-old concession fee debt and uh, has renewed terminal leases. Okay, so let's look at that when we return from the break. Stay with us. <laughs>